So with that, uh, we have a couple of people I'm going to be helping to introduce here tonight. Uh, the first of which is going to be our moderator for uh, the time being. So big thank you to the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition. Um, today here we are joined by Rachel Rubenstein. Uh, and so she's going to introduce our actual presenter for the evening. But for the time being, um, I'm going to introduce Rachel. Uh, Rachel Rubenstein is a board certified licensed clinical social worker in the state of Arizona with over 20 years experience in the mental health field. She currently provides telehealth counseling services to communities across the state of Arizona, including children, adolescents, and adults. She is the founder and clinical director of the Counseling Consultants, PLLC, a group practice of licensed mental health professionals that provides counseling services, including EMDR, DBT, groups for adolescents, couples therapy, and general mental health services to individuals and families. Services are also provided in Spanish. A few of her areas of clinical expertise include trauma and PTSD, which is the EMDR, uh, depression, anxiety, divorce, uh, adolescence, and young adults. Rachel is also the board chair of the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition, which is a big part of bringing this whole thing together. Um, a professionals group that is dedicated to providing resources and education to those professionals supporting youth and families through prevention and education regarding mental health, eating disorders, and substance use. She is bilingual, and I encourage you all to test her on that uh, with Spanish and English. Uh, she enjoys creative arts, travel, food, and her two adorable children. Uh, so without any further ado, let's all just give a big round of applause. I know we're all muted and things like that, but big round of applause for Rachel Rubenstein, everybody. Nerd. Thank you, Jordan. You are so funny. Uh, you're so funny. Um, thank you everyone for being here on a Wednesday afternoon. It's so exciting because we had this uh, presentation earlier in August and it was so awesome and so interesting. We had requests to do it again and here we are. So before we get started with introducing our National Guard presenter, I wanted to just give a quick shout out to Aurora Behavioral Health for co-hosting with the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition. We love working with you. We love reaching um, the community and collaborating. And this is, a, this is a great program. So special thank you to Jordan Peterson for organizing us. Uh, Debbie Edelman and Kevin Brown, thank you so much. So really appreciate that. And the National Guard, we love you so much. They help the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition so much with uh, first organizing us, helping us become um, more professional and be able to um, put out the word and the mission and um, reach more people. If you're interested in learning more about the coalition, you are welcome to contact me. My contact information is at the end of this presentation and we invite professionals, parents, interested adults uh, to join us in events. And we have lunch and learns and all kinds of things just like this event tonight. So again, we're so grateful to the National Guard. We love you guys so much. Um, specifically, the Arizona National Guard Drug Demand Reduction and Outreach. Um, their mission is centralized around the ability to enhance supported coalitions and community-based organizations. They partner with local, state, and tribal organizations delivering strategic prevention leadership, expertise, and evidence-based practices designed to optimize our state's ability to minimize the demand for drugs and substance abuse. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for your service. A little bit about our presenter. She's back by popular demand. Uh, Sergeant Ashley Thompson of the US Army. Ashley is native to Arizona, born and raised in the Northern Phoenix Glendale area. She's currently a Sergeant in the US Army and has been serving for over 13 years as a logistician. Did I say it right, Ashley? I didn't, but we all know what I'm saying, but yes, <laughs> uh, yes, that what she just said, I won't be able to say that, um, serving both as regular active duty and now active Arizona Army National Guard on the counter drug task force drug demand reduction team since 2019. Sergeant Thompson graduated from ASU with a BA in the inter interdisciplinary studies of criminology and social welfare. She will soon be a wife and mom to six kids ages 12 to 3 in a blended family and so excited to have her a quick reminder I will be collecting questions that you have throughout uh, uh, Sergeant Thompson's presentation and at the end we're going to go through all of your questions so go ahead and put them in the chat or the q a I will 
manage them and we'll get to your questions as, as soon as we are um, through with the wonderful presentation. So without further ado, we have Sergeant Ashley Thompson. Thank you, Rachel. And I actually, so a treat for you guys that it's kind of a little twist. If you attended the last one, um, I did it all. However, um, part of our goal with our team is that everybody has the same capabilities um, because eventually one person will get stressed, stretched too thin. So I come with <laughs> uh, Tech Sergeant Amanda Popsy, who is going, we're going to essentially tag team this presentation. She's going to do a portion of it as well as myself um, about her. She's been with the same with our DDRO team for about two years and in the Arizona Air, um, Air National Guard. So she's Air Force for the last 10 years. Uh, she's a tech sergeant, also born and raised in Arizona. Um, and she has four kids. So we come with a lot of knowledge about being moms. Um, and obviously with the DDRO, we spend our, our time, majority of our time doing drug prevention work. So this really hits home to us. Our kids are just getting to the age of technology. Um, so definitely, um, it's definitely a passion for us. So she'll jump in about midway through, um, but without further ado, we will jump into the presentation. It, we are gonna start with a um, survey. So if you have a phone, if you have something that you can scan a QR code with, please take it out and scan that for me. Um, Amanda, are you still able to share screen? You, sure, you ready for me to share it? Yes, ma'am. Bear with me one moment and I'll make sure my sound is good to go as well before I move forward. Okay. Can everyone see the presentation? Thompson, are you good to go? I'm not seeing all my tabs open on my other screen. Looks good. Perfect, thank you. All right, so on the, side, on the next slide, you guys will see that QR code. Um, we can go ahead and put the survey link also in the chat if you don't have a way to scan it. Just one second and I will get that in the chat box for you. Uh, but we're gonna give it just a couple minutes so you guys have the time to go through those questions. Essentially what we're doing is this project that helped develop this presentation um, is being under review or it's being evaluated for its effectiveness within the people that receive the presentation. I will say if you do not live in Arizona, please do not take the survey right now. It's only, we're only surveying um, Arizona based residents. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult on the evaluation side when we have out of state entities. And a lot of the questions are based for Arizona residents. So again, if you have, if you can, please go to this um, QR code or website in the chat box, take the survey real quick, and then we will jump into the next part. And a reminder, this is Rachel, a reminder that uh, feel free to put in any questions that you have, and we will be sure to address those at the end of the presentation. While people are filling that out, uh, I'm curious to know who is out of state. If you put in the chat, I'll read them out. I'm curious what uh, other states are joining us. Florida, welcome. Washington, Florida, again, Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania, yay. Butler, PA, Washington, North Carolina, Florida. Wonderful. Thank you for being with us. Australia, thank you. Arizona, yay. Montana. I will say I love to see so many international or well, international and national people um, getting this information. It's great. All right, so with that, we'll go on to the next slide. Again, you guys can still take the survey, um, but we are gonna go through it just for time purposes. So my question for you guys and in the audience is, 
how many of you have kids in your life? And I'm assuming if you're sitting in this presentation, you probably have children in your life in some fashion. So in the chat box, can you put in there in what way does a child impact your life? Are they your grandchild? Are they your child? Are they a student? Um, are, are you in a clinical setting? Um, just put in the chat box how you have youth in your life. Child, children, teenage son, four kids also work with youth. Teenagers uh, work in pediatrics, parent and school counselor, own kids, uh, lots of children in the teenage range, uh, daughter and son, youth leader and aunt, high school social worker, teenagers. All right, so we have a large variety as you guys can see of adults who have youth in their life. Um, and the reason that I asked that question is because when we start talking about substances, on the next slide, I ask, how do you think that they are obtaining the substances that they're looking for? So how do you think that these kids are getting their hands on marijuana, alcohol, prescription drugs, or anything else that they might be looking for? Um, go ahead and put it in the chat box as well. Peers, peers, older kids, school peers, Snapchat and Instagram, family and friends, older siblings, neighbors, social media, parents, Snapchat. All right, so those are the kind of the answers that I look for. And if you guys see me looking in a different direction, I'm looking at a second screen, so just so you're aware. Um, those are actually the answers that I do look for. A lot of the time, individuals who are of the parenting age um, start to think that their kids are getting these substances from people that they know or um, an acquaintance or somebody that has a connection to the substance that they're looking for. But the reality is, is that these kids now have the ability to get these substances on social media, which I saw a couple input um, about the Snapchat, Instagram, and that's really what we're going to be talking about today. In the next slide. Welcome to the newest trend in drug use. It's not new to your kids, though. Social media drug deals, drugs being sold online through sites like Facebook and Instagram. Well, new tonight, 24 Hour News 8's Heather Walker in studio control with what parents need to know about this new trend. That's right, Brian, and it's popular because it's convenient, but some warn it's more dangerous than traditional drug buying because the buyer doesn't know who their dealer is. Most kids have a Facebook and Instagram to keep in touch with friends, but those accounts can also get them in touch with a drug dealer. A simple search for hashtag Kush, codeine, or whatever drug they want will bring up thousands and sometimes millions of posts. Welcome. I forgot I was muted. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, TikTok, just to name a few, all have the same potential for being dangerous for our youth. Um, however, again, today we are going to talk specifically about Snapchat. Um, today's presentation, uh, we're going to go through all aspects of Snapchat. We're going to identify uh, the application's origins, the appeal to our youth, who is currently using Snapchat, how they're using it, the risk associated with Snapchat, and then we're going to hear some stories from law enforcement regarding encounter, encounters or cases that have involved Snapchat on um, through drug deals or overdoses. We're going to hear a personal family impacted by Snapchat drug dealing. And then finally, we're going to talk about what professionals, parents, and caretakers can do to protect the youth in their lives. Um, as we jump into the presentation, though, I will ask that parents currently with youth attending or youth in, in um, hearing range of this presentation um, either ask them to leave or be aware that this is meant for those that are over the age of 18, because again, we don't want to teach our kids how to do these kind of things. We want to inform our, our adults. All right. So what is Snapchat and how do you access it? Snapchat was developed in 2011 by a group of Stanford University students. Since its development, Snapchat has expanded its capabilities and offerings to its users, rolling out multiple updated versions over the years. Uh, we are going to discuss some of those features further on in the presentation. Um, but the users can access Snapchat from any device that has internet capabilities. This includes, but again, is not limited to desktops, laptops, personal computers, tablets, and cell phones. Um, on the cell phones, it can be downloaded through uh, the Android or iOS platforms. So again, when I say anything with internet activity um, or internet capabilities, it has a worldwide web website that individuals can go to from a desktop 
at school or at home. Next slide. So why is Snapchat so popular? Um, like other applications listed on the previous slide, Snapchat is a social media platform designed to connect friends, family to whoever, to um, each other. However, the most appealing piece to the user is that self-destruction feature. Snapchat was developed and is marketed as a platform you can use to send messages, photos, and videos with a viewing timer. And once that time is reached, the photo or video deletes. So for photos and videos specifically, the user can set a timer and upon the recipient opening that message, it'll get, they have the ability to add a 10 second timer for view time. Once that timer is met, um, the photo or video closes automatically. For messages, so like text message, the user can choose that the messages delete instantaneously, so as soon as the person opens it, or within 24 hours after opening it. All content posted to an individual story is available for viewing up to 24 hours unless the user changes that time frame. Um, pr promoting the self-destruction feature has built that false sense of security and anonymity within our youth because, again, what better way to send messages that we don't want the adults in our life to see than through an application that deletes it automatically for you. So the next couple slides are gonna be imperative to having basic understanding of how Snapchat works. I would recommend that you guys either take screenshots, have your phone out with your camera to kind of get the information to save the slides that I'm gonna show you because you're gonna to wanna to look back at these if you have any kind of questions. So Snapchat features, this is gonna be a lot. First, the Snapchat application or company is constantly working to keep up with other evolving application trends. Um, the list you see here is just scratching the surface of what Snapchat capabilities currently have. Um, when I say they keep up with other trends, you'll start to see other like abilities on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok. Um, Instagram never used to have a real feed until um, TikTok came out and now they have a real feed. So they all compete with each other. And in that competition, they update their applications with that same or like feature. Um, today, we are going to talk about the most pertinent for Snapchat though. First, um, the most recent update is the Snap Audio Video. When I think of the Snap Audio Video, I want you guys to think about FaceTime or Google Duo. Essentially, it is a way to call somebody on your friends list, either over a video FaceTime call or a regular phone type audio call. Um, you don't need to have their phone number listed in your phone. They could just be your friend on Snapchat. Um, and you can go through and select to FaceTime audio or FaceTime video call them. Now, when you do that, it does not show up in the application. It shows up in the regular phone call log. And I do want to address the question I just saw. When I say users, I'm saying the application user. So the individual using the application at that time. That's a good question. And I need to come up with maybe a different word for it. So again, the calls are tracked within the um, phone call log, not the application. We know that phone call logs can be deleted by picking and choosing whichever one wants to be deleted. Um, voice messages or photo video sharing, those work the same way as a regular phone does, a regular um, service provider would. You can send photos, videos, you can add the fancy um, text on the videos and photos, you can add music, you can add emojis. And as you can see in the bottom screen, they have bunny ears. So they're appealing to our youth right off the bat. Um, and those are called snap filters, the add-ons that are added to the media. Um, the happening now feature is a feature that includes a feed of content aimed at allowing the user to see what's going on in the world around them. So if they know that something is happening in a different part of the world, they can look at the happening now feed and it'll show them pertinent or popular posts that have been made public. <coughs> the snap cash feature um, is a way to transfer money within the application itself. Snapchat did partner with Venmo. So they have the, the, through that partnership, the ability to transfer funds. Now this is only on the snap premium where you pay a monthly premium to use a more advanced, I'd say version of Snapchat. I apologize guys, I had allergies. Um, and then you can transfer money directly. Uh, the Snap Score. So this is a feature. This feature is a competitive scoring system that Snapchat users strive to build. It also helps to indicate how active an individual is on the platform. Snapchat combines a number of snaps sent and received, stories posted, and other unknown factors to determine the Snap user's score. 
And this score is visible to the public under the username. So as you can see in the middle of the screen where it says Ashley, that would be my SNAP score that I have built just through research. The higher the score, the more prevalent the user or the account holder. Um, the higher the score goes, Snapchat has the ability to take that account and feature that person as what they call a SNAP star. Um, but the biggest piece that I wanna talk about is the SNAP map. So that's gonna be the picture at the top of your screen. Essentially, this feature allows users to access a worldwide map showing other Snapchat users content that has been made public. So depending on the, the individual's privacy settings and location settings, ind other individuals that are on their friends list will have the ability to see locations um, of those individuals on this map by way of the bit emoji. So that's the human-like cartoon figure. <clears throat> Number one uh, that you see all over the map and then a closer up video, uh, photo of it, you can see below the picture. These are personalized by the individuals, so they make them look just like them, or um, they maybe add or change ways maybe they want to look like. Um, this only shows up on the map, though, if the individuals have their location settings turned on. Um, the creator will also um, use this to kind of see where their friends are at. And I'll talk a little bit more why the bit emoji and the location settings are so important. Um, but with the map itself, when you open up the map, you see the blue clouds. Those are not weather clouds. Those are actual public content that's been posted to a map, to this map. So an individual can click on that blue cloud and it will scroll through the public content that's been posted. The person that posts that content has the ability to add a contact me feature. And I'll talk a little bit more later about why that's important to remember. Um, but the more content that's posted in a specific area, that area will start to have a red cloud over it. Um, that red cloud means that it's hot with content or there's a lot of activity in that specific area. So if you have a concert going on, if you have, for instance, the civil unrest that happened around the country, different areas had a red bubble around maybe the biggest city in that state because there was a lot of content being posted. All right, so on the next slide, we are gonna talk more in depth about the Snap Map because this is really how our kids are getting the access to what they're getting. So how does it work? Snapchat was, or the Snap Map was launched in June of 2017. So again, a couple of years after the application came out. Um, when you open up the application, it will open up to a camera feature, which is what you can see in that very first photo on the left hand side. And it again, it looks like just a normal camera feature. If you look at the bottom left hand side, though, there is a pin drop. And if you select that pin drop, it will open up to that second picture. Um, and as you can see, this second picture opens up to a zoomed out version of what that map looks like. And at that point, you can scroll to different parts of the country if you want to see what's going on in different areas. Um, if you use the zoom feature, which is just like any um, zoom feature on a camera, so the two fingers to zoom in, zoom out, it opens up into that third photo. As you can see, this is more, um, this is Phoenix area. But as you zoom in, those blue clouds become prevalent over specific areas of whatever city or town that you're looking at. And so again, that third photo does show what that zoom in feature looks like. You'll start to see those bit emojis get more centralized over whatever location that they're in. Um, and then that last photo is actually, if you continue to zoom in, it shows what it looks like if you were um, looking at a Google map or a satellite map of that area. So it becomes very descriptive in what it shows. It, to me, it reminds me exactly of a Google map. Um, if your location settings are on, so if I were to scroll, zoom into the, um, the individual you see on the third photo that says Tamara, if I were to scroll in, it would show me standing directly over her house. The reason that it's important to understand the location settings is because Snapchat's location settings are incredibly accurate. I tested this out in my own home. I stood in the back of my property, opened up Snap, the Snap map and watched myself move on the map, specifically from the back of my property to the front of my property. So if your youth have these on, then anybody that they're friends with can see that same exact thing happening. On the next slide, you guys are gonna see uh, me walk through how to scroll through the map content. So how you open it, how you scroll through it, um, how you can skip whatever you're looking at by sliding right. 
Um, one thing that I do want to point out to you guys, when you see the content start to scroll through, it lists the city, state, and how long ago the post was made at the top left-hand corner of that photo. And then again, sliding down, we'll close the snap map. So we'll go ahead and watch real quick this video feed. So again, I'm pointing out the top left-hand corner has the city, state, and how long ago it was posted. And again, I have no rhyme or reason to these individuals content that I'm looking at. I don't know them. We don't have any kind of acquaintance. Um, I just picked an area in Arizona and scrolled through. Um, people are putting their children all over these applications. Children are all over these applications. So you can imagine the different kinds of things that we see. And then again, if you scroll down, it closes the map out and you can look at a new area. All right, on the next slide, we talk a little bit more about how you post content onto these applications. Amanda, can we scroll to the next slide? All right, so how do you post content to a snap map? Um, when you decide to do that, again, it shows you the camera function. You take a regular photo or video from that function when you open up the application. After that video is taken, you'll see the bottom of the screen, there's a yellow button. When you click on that yellow button, it opens up what looks like a friends list or the individuals that you have added to your friends list. At the top of that, you have two options. You can either add it to your story, which is like what we see on the other applications when somebody has a ring around their photo um, and you click on it and it scrolls through whatever they've posted for their friends on their friends list to see, or you can post it to the snap map. When somebody agrees to post something to the snap map, they're agreeing that that photo that they're posting is going to be geolocated over the current area that they're posting it. So they're automatically saying, yes, you can use my location for this content. Next slide. When you open public content on Snap Map um, and you see the view creator button at the bottom of anything you're scrolling through, that means that the individual who posted that is giving the ability for people to contact them directly through the application. Um, so again, this is how our youth are contact, making contact with individuals they otherwise would have never known. Um, adding a friend on Snapchat does not require you to add them to your phone by number. So they don't require any phone number or anything like that. And it is also not required that you have any contacts in common. So usually on Snapchat or Instagram, it'll have a list of people you may know. Whereas with Snapchat, it can be anybody. Um, so you'll see in this short video, um, there is music to it, but I scroll through what it looks like when you get the view creator. You can open it up and I can add this individual. I can subscribe to them. I can see where they've been posting things. Again, I have no ties to these people that I'm scrolling through. <clears throat> So that's what where that's what the application looks like or how our kids are getting in contact with these people. Now what is important to know though is what things mean when you see them. So if you're looking at your use phone, it's important to know the, the status indicators. So what are status indicators? Um, Snapchat has implemented a way to indicate a user's status within their conversation or within the person that they're talking to. Emojis are added next to the username where certain milestones are met. And the number next to the emoji indicates how many days they have met that milestone. So for the, all, for the purposes of the next slide, I want you guys to keep in mind the Elmina girl. So this is, assume that you're looking at your child's phone with, and they're talking to Elmina girl. This is what you see looking at their phone. And it, you can see she has the number 13 with a fire symbol and a smiley face emoji. So this next slide, guys, this is the one that I really want you guys to take a photo of, <clears throat> but this is what those milestones mean. So remember I said Almina girl, for 13 days, she had the fire symbol. That fire symbol means that they are on a snap streak. So they have had Snapchat conversations with that person and that person has sent them a message back. The number of days increases as that contact continues. So again, it's back and forth communication. They, I've sent a message, they've sent one back. The smiley face indicates that that individual is a best friend of the, your youth. So again, we're, we're pretending we're looking at, a, at their phone. That individual is a best friend of theirs. 
They send this person a lot of snaps or a lot of messages, but they're not the number one best friend. So when I say number one best friend, again, we're appealing to youth. Kids have, you know, their best best friend, their number two best friend. Um, Snapchat does the same thing. It uses the same mentality or same kind of um, thought process. The reason it's important to understand what these milestones mean is because if you look at your youth phone and it says Almina girl, 13, fire symbol, and a smiley face, you know that they're having a lot of conversation with that person. Well, the, if you see an hourglass pop up eventually, that means that that, comp, that snap streak is about to end. So for whatever reason, the communication has stopped or slowed down. Maybe that's a point to ask, who is this person if you don't know who they are? Um, also, if you see a baby, the baby emoji, this means that they just became friends with that person. So maybe asking who is this new person you're talking to on Snapchat? Uh, the gold star, this is someone has replayed this person's snap within the last 24 hours. So they must see something interesting that they, they saw on their content. So these are all conversation pieces that can be used with your kids if you see them on there. So as I said, if you guys have the ability to screenshot or take photos, this is definitely one to save. Next slide. So who is versus who is not on Snapchat? Snapchat's age policy is in compliance with the US Children's Online Privacy Protection Act or COPA in that the minimum age to create an account is 13. Um, Snapchat asks for a date of birth upon sign up, And if the date of birth indicates that the user is under 13, then they will not be allowed to make an account. But again, we all know kids don't necessarily tell the truth when they wanna get on something like this. So they'll, they'll mess around with the date to make them over the age. As of January 2021, Snapchat was reporting 265 million daily users. Um, the United States had the biggest Snapchat user base in the world with an audience of about 108 million users. That is daily. India does rank behind us at 74.35 million users. Um, but the photo sharing platform is projected to reach nearly 400 million global users by 2024. And I would suggest that they would get there far before 2024. The interesting part though about this data that I want you guys to really pay attention to is where it says 15 to 25 year olds account for 48% of the 265 million daily users. Think about that compared to that common parenting age, 26 to 35, where there is only 30% of that 265 million on this application. So there's not even enough adults to monitor what our kids are seeing. In April of 2020, Market Charts con uh, conducted a survey with 5,200 te U.S. teenagers averaging an age of 16 years and two months. Uh, this survey concluded that teens favored Snapchat over Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook as a form of communication. So they specifically say that they use Snapchat to communicate as the other ones are used for entertainment. So U.S. frequency of access by age. This chart is from 2018. Um, but what is important about this, and it needs to be mentioned, is that the data indicated a large percentage of in individuals ranging from 30 to 65 years old, again, that common parenting age, have never been on the application, whereas 47% of your 18 to 29 year olds are on it at least once a day. So big difference. So what are the risks? Snapchat in and of itself is not bad just like all the other applications. However, it has its dangers that are unique to its platform. The first thing parents should know is that Snapchat does not allow third-party monitoring. So the applications that you use to monitor your teen's activity on their phones will not work if Snapchat is open. So the two, one of two things is gonna happen. The monitoring application won't work or the Snapchat will um, the monitoring application will work and Snapchat will not. So one of the two is going to happen. What I have seen is parents who have a tracking device or something on their app, on their teen's phone, when the teen opens up Snapchat, the tracking automatically turns off. And parents have said, well, why are you turning off your GPS location? You're not supposed to turn that off. And the kid has no idea how that got turned off. Well, it got turned off because they opened up Snapchat. The point behind that is, it's supposed to be the disappearing content application. So they don't want the ability for somebody to be seeing the content that that individual is looking at. Um, Snapchat, another risk is that it provides, again, the user's location via the Snap Map. If you do not turn off your location settings in the application and on your phone settings, um, app, the Snapchat application automatically presets 
to having the location settings on. So you can turn them off in the app, but they will still be on on the phone and you'll still see them on the application. You have to turn them off in both areas. Uh, the disappearing content. So again, youth can set timers if they don't want people to see the messages or people that they didn't intend to see the messages. Um, screenshots. This one is imperative for parents. If screenshots are taken of any Snapchat content, that person who posted that will get a message saying that somebody took a screenshot and it will send the individual's name or name or screen name of who did that. So it'll it'll notify that creator, that content creator, that such and such just screenshotted your, your content. This is applicable to anything on SnapMap, anything personally sent. Again, it, Snapchat is not meant to be a platform where you can keep messages. So it gives it notifies the person that if you felt it was important enough to keep, then it's important enough to notify the creator. So parents scrolling through the Snap Map, screenshot something, it will send it to that drug dealer. And I'll show you guys what I mean um, if you do that through the application. So what kids are doing, as you can see in that third photo, this was actually content that I found here in Arizona. Um, it was four Snapchats long. And what I did is I used a second phone and I screenshot, I, I video recorded it and I took pictures of what I was seeing. Um, that's the safest way, but that's how these kids are also passing around some menus. And we'll talk, you'll see more about the menus later on. Um, but as you can see in the fourth photo, how it indicates to the individual that a screenshot was taken. Um, Snapchat does provide the ability to buy, sell anything, including the illicit drugs. Um, users can, Snapchat users looking to sell drugs can post anonymous public stories, which again is that third picture. And then eventually when they're ready to make contact with people, they can either put the view creator button on there or they can put an at symbol with their screen name to other platforms. So if they want them to contact them on Instagram, they'll put the at symbol and in their Instagram screen name. Um, Snapchat users provide the ability for viewers to uh, send them money. We talked about that in the beginning. And in the um, recent past, and honestly, it's probably now that it's being promoted more, that's that money transfer option is likely to come back onto the public platform because I've even been seeing it promoted on Venmo. So this next video, before we get it played, um, it talks about the ease of access to the world around the user, the Snapchat user that the application provides and makes the ability to obtain any substance seamless and makes it hard to catch the drug dealers. And if you know, you have to know as a caregiver what it is that you're looking for. Um, what is important to know about this, snap, this video clip that you're gonna watch is yes, it was recorded in the UK. The reason I point that out is because it was recorded in the UK in 2016. So they've been dealing with this for a lot longer than, or they've realized this problem a lot earlier than we have. However, we have to catch up. There is no video that I have found done by Vice, done by any kind of um, individual undercover trying to, to bring to light the same kind of thing in the United States. I've just got a message from someone called Plug Life. He just goes, hi, hey, how are you? Oh, I keep asking them how they are. <laughs> oh God, it's popping off. He wants to post it. And I guess in a way that kind of makes it less intimidating for kids to buy drugs. All they need is an address and a Snapchat account. Okay, I hope we are to proceed immediately. He's a bit aggy. I don't want to order off this guy. I got a message from this guy being like, yo, what's your order um, and where are you located? And I said, hey, I'm in London. Is that okay? And he goes, yeah, what's your order and what's your address for drop off? That literally took me five minutes and I could already be going to pick up some drugs. So as you guys can see, these dealers are fearless. They make it easy. I mean, they make it so easy that they'll even meet our kids wherever they're at. So that's how we're seeing a lot of these 14 year olds that are overdosing. Understanding how easy it is for our kids to get their hands on stuff leads me to talk about the current trends um, being seen around the United States involving counterfeit pills. So I do ask in a in-person setting, could you really tell the difference between the four pills that you see on your screen? No, the answer is no. If you can't tell the difference, your kids can't tell the difference. Counterfeit pills are lookalike pills to real pharmaceuticals. Counterfeit pills are pills that are not provided through a doctor or pharmacy, but rather through a production on the streets or by cartels and then sold by drug dealers. Producing these pills 
give the maker the ability to add anything to them like fentanyl and then call it by its lookalike name such as oxycotton um, which is depicted in this picture with that being said purchasing substances from complete strangers opens our kids to a whole new set of risks um, teens often again are unaware of the contents of the substances they are purchasing they think that they're getting oxycotton they think that they're getting percocet they think that they're getting xanax when in reality they are getting counterfeit pills that have been pressed by strangers and have large quantities of fentanyl that are included in them because again it's not mandates not tracked in recent news stories it's been reported that teens who overdosed on substances purchased from snapchat users thought they were buying items such as percocet through the investigation process it was proven time and time again that they were they had overdosed on large quantities of fentanyl um, professionals in teen diversion, I'm sorry, guys, you can probably hear my daughter. <laughs> professionals in teen diversion field have also reported that some of the teens that they're getting in um, through different crimes that they've been caught doing, that the kids that have to provide those urinalysis tests are coming back positive for fentanyl. And the response from these kids is either I would never take that stuff or I don't even know what that is. So the DEA is seeing it. The DEA has released multiple articles supporting these trends in that counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl are circ circulating the United States to include Arizona communities. Um, and those who are ingesting them are not aware of the contents. So these are just a couple stories recently within the last six months. The first one, um, June of this year, we had Kendall Hawkins, a 31 year old of Goodyear. He was arrested with 11 other individuals transporting fentanyl pills from Washington to Arizona. When he was caught, he had 50,000 fentanyl tainted pills and five firearms with two silencers. So guys, this is an entire organization. They are state to state. They transfer, they're easy to transfer because they're so small. Um, but again, this is, this is on a national scale. Next slide. And I'm sorry guys, she's probably gonna yell for like the next five slides, but then Amanda takes you and I will be able to address her. <laughs> Um, Arizona law enforcement sees this. So these are just a couple stories that we've had in, again in the last six months. The first one is an individual who was a 21 year old woman arrested by the, um, what? Sorry, she was arrested by deputies after they discovered what they thought was 50,000 fentanyl laced pills and during a traffic stop in Gila County. And I guess she looks happy because this is it's that easy to do. There's a low perception of risk in doing this kind of stuff. Um, July 7th on I-17 near Cortis Junction, Yavapai County Sheriff said that their canine detected 203 pounds of packaged meth and 28,000 fentanyl pills worth over a million dollars in a van that they was used for vehicle transports. And then if you are from Arizona, you may have seen that last um, slide. It is from February, 2021, when an El Mirage family found what they believe to be about 5,000 counterfeit pills that were stuffed inside of a glow worm, glow worm toy that they bought from a thrift store for their young child. So they got it home, they took it apart, and they were going to wash it, and they found all of these pills. But I saw, um, I'm going to pause real quick so I can address this little girl who is having a meltdown outside my door, <laughs> and I will be right back. I apologize. And please remember, we're getting some great questions. Um, you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat. We have some questions about Bark and other apps. So I'm looking forward to uh, having, having those addressed. Rachel, I have a quick question. Is there um, the chat, the Q&A is separate from the chat box. Is that correct? I... It is. It's just a different method for asking a question. It seems like okay. it's a little easier with chat. Okay, perfect. I wasn't sure if there was another place that we should look when uh, the time comes or if it'll be on the chat as well. So. And I've, I've been writing them down and I know Kevin's oh, been writing them down. Perfect. So between perfect. the two of us, we'll, we'll get you. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I am so sorry. These evening 
presentations can be a little chaotic when you have kids. <laughs> All right, so jumping back in, um, on this next slide, we talk about the Arizona High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area or HIDA. There are multiple HIDAs around the country. The Arizona region is obviously the one that I'm gonna talk about. Um, they have allotted 30% of their task force to doing just Snapchat surveillance. Um, so that goes to show you these are narcotics officers, these are undercover officers that spend every day trying to stop the buy, sell, and trade of illicit substances. They've devoted 30% of their task force just to catching these guys. Um, they've seized more than $3 million in cash in the last three years, and that's likely going to be a, a extremely higher number once this year's um, numbers come out, because as most of you have seen or maybe heard, the overdose rates around the country have skyrocketed since COVID. Next slide. So general risks for teens and substance use. Trying illicit drugs increases the chances of overdosing and or forming an addiction, even if it is just one time. Illicit drugs such as fentanyl are proven to have a detrimental long-term effect on young adolescent brains, growth, and overall health. So you guys, this is the point to all of this. Our youth are dying, and part of the reason is that they have the ability to get anything they want they have a low perception of risk related to, in specifically for Arizona, the Arizona Youth Survey data. Um, and finally, they don't know what it is that they're actually getting. Many of you may have seen the 2020 story at the top of your screen or even received a presentation from this individual's uncle. Uh, the individual at the top of your screen is Ivan Aguirre. His uncle is Paul Aguirre, the recently retired um, Arizona National Guard Air Force Colonel who commanded my team with the Arizona Counter Drug Task Force. Retired Colonel Aguirre spent many years working in drug prevention on the counter drug ta um, task force, trying to stop things like fentanyl. But again, fentanyl does is not biased. It does not go after one group of people, one demographic. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to you, your youth, your youth's friends, or your family. Um, October of 2020, October 20th of 2020, we did have a Prescott Valley 14 year old female who overdosed and died on fentanyl lace pills that she obtained from two 18 year olds. And what's interesting about this is when you read some of the news articles, this, in, this female had tried to talk to these um, individuals and chastise them for doing, selling this kind of stuff saying, why would you do that? You know, it's dangerous. And she ultimately still ended up taking something that took her life. 2019, sorry, we had a 17 year old Cottonwood area teen overdose and die from what appeared to be counterfeit pills as well. The Cottonwood teenager was found unresponsive in his bedroom. And when they went through the investigation process, they did find a safe with 24 off white pills stamped with M30. So I know it's common for us to see the blue pill, but again, it can be in any form because it's not produced by a pharmacy. Next slide. So the drug Snapchat drug dealing is also again being seen around the United States. So it's not just an Arizona problem. I know we said we, I saw that we have people in here from Florida. <clears throat> We've got stories that you can see here from Tyler. We've got LA, Utah. So if you do a simple Google search for Snapchat or fentanyl um, related deaths, you're going to find multiple stories in just your community. Next slide. So who are the dealers? Drug dealers using Snapchat are the same people you and I were educated about and are used to, but the only difference is, is that they moved off of the streets and in onto the internet. This means that cartel members are still actively seeking individuals to push their drugs. Those drug runners are still actively seeking buyers who are kids, but now they've added that element of the non-acquainted contact, right, via Snapchat. So they no longer need to know somebody who knows somebody who knows how to get the substance that they're looking for. It's no longer just a certain group of kids. It can be your football players. It can be your cheerleaders. They can go on to this application and find people who know nothing about their life and get the, sub the item that they are looking for with the click of a button. So before we play this next slide, I will say um, it, is, it is a nine minute video, however, I had the ability to meet this mom through presentations like this here in Arizona. Um, and her story is, it's heartbreaking. Um, 
but she's taking that and she's helping bring awareness directly to the application and trying to hold the application responsible. And I'll explain a little bit more why she's trying to do that as soon as the video is over. Fentanyl poisoning is real and it's, it's destroying every community. It's destroying all kinds of families. Doing a lot of people without their kids. My name is Amy Neville, and I lost my 14-year-old son, Alexander Neville, on June 23rd, 2020, to fentanyl poisoning. Alex was a very passionate kid. He loved to learn things. The Civil War was his favorite period in history. Uh, he learned about it from a very early age, and you know, we would have birthday parties. He would take friends to Civil War reenactments for a birthday party. Uh, that was his idea of a good time when he was in elementary school. He was always a Cub Scout. He started off in first grade as a Cub Scout, all the way through as a Boy Scout. Um, he definitely was a skateboarder. He loved, loved, loved to skateboard. He uh, loved to learn as much as he could about it, whatever subject he was passionate about. And he would carry that passion for a good year or two and educate everybody around him about it. Uh, he was a very caring brother he, to his sister, Eden. Sixth grade came around and uh, he he first was interested in vaping and so he got in with a new group of friends and had a lot of fun with them and then the seventh grade came around and this group of kids started smoking weed you know of course it was conversations about what it was doing to his brain that was really the angle the perspective that we took Got in trouble a few times in sixth grade and lost his school of choice. And we appealed that, but we lost the appeal. And that was really the turning point. <laughs> Tell seventh grade, Alex had never been in trouble at school. He was always loved by his teachers, always, even up until he passed, it was like, he's always so nice and polite and like, how, how can this happen? Um, so it's hard to understand when a kid that you perceive as a good kid is gone from something like this, but it, it affects everybody. It's not just good kids, bad kids, neglected kids. It's everybody. June 21st, late in the evening, he did come to us and he's like, I gotta talk to you guys. And they sat us down at the kitchen table and proceeded to tell us how he had been taking pills over the course of that week to 10 days <clears throat> and how the pills had really gotten a hold of him and he didn't understand why because again, he's a researcher. <laughs> the stuff that he looked up on it, the things that he learned about taking opioids shouldn't have taken a hold of him so fast. So this is the night of June 21st, and he, he told us how he wanted to go back to his old friends, that this wasn't making him happy, that, and that he needed help. And he wanted to go back to the treatment center he had gone to in the spring. And he was ready. He, you know, and it was like this miracle moment for myself and his father, like, he's coming to us. He wants to do this rather than when we made him go. Um, he was ready to make some change. his room to wake him up. I knocked on his door. As soon as I touched his door, I knew something was wrong. Like, the, just, there was no energy there. It was like a weird feeling. I knocked on the door, and he didn't respond. I 
Alex had taken one pill that he thought was an Oxycontin. One pill. I had no idea at the time that one pill would kill him. I just didn't, we didn't even think it was, it was, you know, when Alex was telling us about the pills, first of all, I was just listening to him because as soon as we started to ask any kind of questions, you know, he would back away and kind of shut down and I wanted to hear everything he had to say that night. We had, uh, <clears throat> I just kind of assumed it was like the old days when but we were taught in our drug prevention programs in school that somebody stole this prescription and now they're selling it. But that wasn't the case. Alexander ordered an, an illegally manufactured pill right off of social media. It may have been delivered to our home, he may have met up with him, but it was easy as ordering a pizza. It's not starting with prescription pills anymore, it's, it's pills right off the streets. And those pills on the streets are, are fentanyl. Fentanyl took his life. Alexander <sighs> Alex didn't want to die and he was very clear about that on June 21st. He didn't know it was fentanyl. I didn't know it was fentanyl. I had never even really heard of it until this happened. Um, he had enough fentanyl in his system to kill three people from one pill. <clears throat> Some people might look at this and say it's an overdose death, but to me, it's fentanyl poisoning. Alexander was not an addict in the traditional sense. Alexander was in this experimental phase. Um, and this experimental phase is killing a lot of our kids right now. The reality is fentanyl is in any pill. Any illicit pill that you purchase is fentanyl. It is not Oxycontin, it is not Percocet, it is not a Xanax, it is fentanyl. And that is something that needs to get drilled into everybody. It's just way too easy for them to get these things. And yes, we need to talk to our kids, but it's more than that, it's, it's, keeping tabs on them, it's checking out their room, it's, um, you know, we want to give them, it's hard because we want to give them this, their privacy, but at the same time, we want to be in their business. <laughs> so I think it's probably different family by family. Of course, I can look back at the situation and think of a thousand things we could have done differently for Alex. But right now, I can only help their families from going through this. <laughs> this is the danger of fentanyl. It is deadly and it has no place in our community. Just two milligrams of fentanyl can be lethal. And just as you've heard in Amy's story, it is extremely accessible. As law enforcement, we are working hard every day to pull fentanyl off our streets. But we need the community's help to prevent this drug from making its way into the hands of our children. That starts with education. Talk to your children early and often about the dangers of opioids and the dangers of experimenting with any kind of drug. In many cases, fentanyl is sold in a counterfeit form, causing accidental overdoses like what happened with young Alex. We don't want to see another family devastated by the effects of opioids. Educate yourself and then talk to other parents about what you have learned. Get in your kid's stuff, and if you see something concerning, address it immediately. Join us in the fight against fentanyl and help us keep our community and our children safe. So, you guys, I know that that was, um, that was a lot. I, like I said, I had mentioned I met Alex's mom uh, through one of these presentations a while back. Um, and we have more that we're going to talk about and i'm going to learn more about the foundation that she started since her son uh, her son's overdose but the point in showing you guys this video is that it is affecting our kids as young as 14 if not younger um through investigation or, and i do want to point out that yes this you guys saw orange county sheriffs as the ones that were um 
hosting this message. Um, Amy does live here in Arizona, or she does have strong ties here with her family in Arizona, which is how we came to communicate. Um, the situation involving her son did happen in California. Um, but again, this is a national problem. This is not just an Arizona problem. They, through the investigation, they did find out that, again, Alex took something that he thought was um, Oxycontin that he received from Snap, uh, somebody on Snapchat or a drug dealer on Snapchat. And the police have explained in this case and in multiple cases that it's happening everywhere and it's extremely hard to catch these individuals. Snapchat does aid law enforcement by way of deleting the account of the person that the child or the individual communicated with. However, in order to identify or get any identifying information, Snapchat requires the warrant process, which can take up to six weeks. And in Alex's situation, it took multiple warrants before Snapchat would even consider releasing information to the police department. Um, and due to federal laws, Snapchat is safe from being held accountable or liable for anyone's actions when Snapchat is used as a means or a vehicle for that communication. So in Alex's situation, Snapchat as the organization cannot be held responsible for what happened to him, even though the person he communicated with, he would have never had contact with had he not had Snapchat as that tool to get in communication. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna stop the screen share and we're gonna give a break into asking or answering any kind of your questions that you may have related directly to the Snapchat presentation. And then we're gonna go into what you guys can do as individuals with youth in your life. Um, and we're gonna talk about multiple different aspects. Amanda's gonna kind of lead you guys through that part of the presentation. But if there's any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will go through them real quick. So thank you for that. that that's such important information and it, it is difficult to watch, but it's so important to watch. I had a question and then we'll start at the beginning. And I, I imagine other people have this question too. How do we, uh, what, what resources are there for our kids to watch and learn? Because I know as a parent of a seventh grader and a therapist, he doesn't wanna hear what I have to say. So I'm wondering if there's any particular videos or how to, how to get that message to them, maybe not through, uh, through us parents as the resource. Yes, so the program that helped us develop this presentation does have a youth version of a fentanyl awareness um, presentation that can be given to kids. It specifically talks about um, what they're, they're calling it the killer among us. So if you guys know youth are kind of into the among us video game um, and it shows what it looks like, um, what fentanyl is, the effects of fentanyl. It talks about kids who have overdosed on this and it shows them the reality of what doing this kind of stuff can cause. Um, those presentations are given at the coalition level. Um, multiple different organizations receive that, this package, which includes a Snapchat. Um, but I would definitely start um, just through the Substance Abuse Coalitions of Arizona, which you guys will see. Um, the resources at the end include talknowaz.com, um, where you can kind of get more information on where to get that. Also, videos like this, um, if even just, so what I do with my son, my son is 12. Um, and if there's something that I kind of want him to see or to focus on or to understand, I screencast it onto our living room TV while I'm making dinner. Um, you know, if he's doing dishes, I'll screencast something and it'll catch his attention because some of it is geared towards kids and it's led to some conversation with us. So for instance, my son had a bad attitude with school and was being disrespectful to teachers. So I played a video of a teacher being frustrated with kids being disrespectful. And he addressed to me how those kids were being rude. And he pointed out their disrespectful attitudes. And I said, okay, well, if you know what it looks like, then why are you doing these kind of things? And all of a sudden we have a different conversation going on of, well, how did you know I was doing those kind of things? So you have to be creative because again, kids don't want to hear this from their parents, but finding ways for them to just see those cues of you don't know what it is. Don't put it in your mouth. If it doesn't come from mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, or the school nurse, don't put it in your mouth. Um, and that's really what it, how I've, I've done it with my son. Um, but again, also being honest for their age. Um, a lot of parents get stuck in the mindset of they're my baby. Um, and they don't really 
talk about the things that these kids already know because they're hearing it at school. Thank you. Um, we did have someone ask if you would share the link to Alex's story, um, if you're able to do that. Absolutely. So we started out with a couple of questions about the app Bark. Uh, the first question is, since Bark can't monitor Snapchat, should a spy program or, um, or kids phone, should a, a sorry, the spy program be put on kids phone to monitor Snapchat? Snapchat will not allow it. Um, essentially, like I said, one of the two things will happen. Either the spy um, application that you put on the phone will operate and Snapchat will not. But more times than not, Snapchat has the better operating power and it will operate on the phone. Even if it's on in the background, it will operate over any monitoring type of app. Okay, so there's no monitoring app that will work? Not that I've come across. Um, we have family link through Verizon because my son is still 12. Um, and it allows me to approve or deny whoever is whatever application he adds on his phone. So he's not been allowed to add Snapchat to his phone. Um, the biggest thing, and we talk about it in the next part is how do you monitor this stuff? Honestly, it's let me see your phone. And it's asking questions. Um, it's opening up these applications and not being the snooping or overbearing parent, but more so setting up those guidelines. And again, I don't want to get too far ahead of it, but we do talk about how you set up those guidelines. Um, and at the end, I can kind of give some personal experience because I'm definitely a component, a, a pro person when it comes to, I'm not going to express how to do something or that somebody should do something that I haven't already tried. So I've implemented a lot of things that you're going to hear today. And it's amazing to see how kids as young as 12 really take that and own it. Um, but again, the applications themselves don't work. They either, they won't work a Snapchat won't work. And I haven't found one that does. That was our next question. So that you just answered it, that there are, there aren't apps to help monitor Snapchat. Uh, the next question is what is a high snap score? Hundreds of thousands. Um, if you look at your kid's phone and their score is in the hundreds of thousands, they're on it all the time, all the time. Um, it's probably the main way that they send text messages, honestly. Um, drug dealers also look at this. So if a parent or let's say even an undercover officer decides they want to have communication with a drug dealer and they have a low snap score, that drug dealer is probably not going to communicate very well because they know that you're either new, a parent, or a police officer. Interesting. So regarding location, their location indicator on Snapchat, if the location is on on a cell phone, is it automatically on Snapchat as well? Are those two things connected? Yes, so the application is preset to keep the location settings on. The only way that they turn off is if you go, once you once it's downloaded on the phone, you go in and you turn it off and you go into your phone settings and turn off location. So what we do with my son's phone is if he needs his location settings for a Google map, um, he allows the settings for the use of that application at that time only. Okay. So you are, you are, uh, you have a close, um, close interaction with your son's phone. It sounds like. Yes, he, <laughs> yes, he, um, and it's funny that you say that because even my mom, you know, I'm 33. So cell phones for me were relatively being able to have a cell phone was relatively new at 16. And so when I'm talking about the things I do with my son's phone, my mom is even like, you're not going to give him his privacy. Well, number one, he's 12. He doesn't have privacy. Um, number two, yes. But when that privacy is broken, I have every reason, or when that trust is broken, I have every reason to get into your privacy. And I don't do it all the time. I, you know, we told him in the beginning that if I have a reason to look, then I'm going to look because I pay for this phone. Um, and we set up other guidelines that he understands that it's my phone and I'm just letting him use it. That's great. Next question is, is it possible to block Snapchat on a child's device or through parental controls on a device that's linked to the child's device? Um, <clears throat> so it depends on who, who owns the profile. So typically when a kid has a phone, the profile is set up under the parent. So it's the parent's email. Um, I know 
for instance, my son, we set up his own email account, um, but it's tied to mine. So you can only block those things based off of age preference. And when the phone is set up, it's set up with an adult email address. So it's more, I don't believe that you can block it. Um, he has like, for instance, he's also, my son's also not allowed to have YouTube on his phone, but he can still see it in the search bar. Interesting. Um, next question is how do we access for my eyes only? For my eyes only. I'm not sure what that is. Whoever submitted that question, if you want to put in some more detail on that, we can address that. Um, uh, next question is, can location be found on Instagram as well? Instagram is not an application I have full, a very basic knowledge on. Um, I dove into Snapchat specifically because of the map function. Um, I know that Snapchat or that Instagram has adopted the vanishing messaging um, feature. They call it vanish as opposed to a timer or anything like that. Um, but I'm not sure if they have the same tracking capabilities as Snapchat would. Cause I don't, I don't know on what platform it would show that on Snapchat. It shows it through the map. Okay. Next question is why will police not address this? Um, even when provided the map on Snapchat as well as proof. So they are, um, the law enforcement are very, very well, aware of this application and its capabilities, which is why, again, we have those undercover narcotics officers that are spending so much time on Snapchat. Another part of my goal with this presentation is to be informing law enforcement so that they can, if they're SROs, if they're people that aren't necessarily undercover officers, that they are able to look at the Snap map and see what's going on, even in their precincts or in their beats that they're working. So for my eyes only, you access when the camera page is on. Hmm. I'm going to have to look into that because I don't have, I don't have any idea about that one. The next question is about an app called Life360. Is that, can I ask that question? Life360. Yeah. You can ask him. We have Life360 on all of our phones in the family. If my kids have Life360 activated, and I ask them to turn off Snapchat locator, does it affect Life360? We haven't have had an issue with our with our, our daughter disappearing on Life360. So okay, so this one I do know. Um, when Snapchat is open, even in the background, it will automatically turn off the location settings on those other devices. So yes, even if she closes it, let's see from view, if she doesn't close it out completely, then it will still leave the location settings off. Interesting, okay. Next question is, can you speak to the problem of kids using smelling salts to give them an energetic rush to study or to be more energetic in sports? I don't have any information on that one. Okay, we'll do a little research and send it out. Okay. Um, Someone wants to know if you come to high school. So <laughs> we do. Um, that's actually how I met Amy. We were at Queen Creek, Queen Creek High School presenting this. Um, if there is a group of parents that can be put together, then yes, we come out in the evening time like this. And I've done these both in person and as you can see virtually. So here comes straight from the uh, from our chat. The question is, so others can see the user snap score, um, not just the user. And if so, then that is dangerous for nefarious people to see who else they can groom or contact that the user maybe know or trust and have contact yeah. with them. I think I thought, I know it's not a question. I just thought it was really important. Yes, so the snap score is, is public. You can see it next to any screen user. Um, when you open up the Snapchat and look at the friends list and have a conversation with that individual, um, you can see the, the score itself on the screen. Next question is, is there such a, is there such a thing anymore as just a phone that can only call or text to give our kids so they can't have any social media, but Flip we can phones. still get in touch with Flip <laughs> phones. <laughs> Every officer I talk to, they recommend flip phones. Okay. That one. <laughs> What's that, Jordan? Oh, sorry to interrupt. I said, I was waiting for that one. I, in my head, I was like, flip phones. <laughs> Okay, how do you explain to your child why they can't have Snapchat when everyone has it? And can the app be avoided? Um, the best explanation is that it's for their safety. 
Um, it's not safe. You're not old enough. Um, why do you need Snapchat when you can send voice messages and text to a phone number? Yeah. Uh, next question is how exactly does the child find the drug dealers on Snapchat? Just through that regular scrolling, like I showed you guys, um, when you click on any blue circle, they have them publicly um, listed on there. And then it just takes knowing one person or getting in contact with one person on SnapMap. And then they can have that communication to find other people. Uh, next question is, can you explain the ghost by Snapchat score? The, um, the, so you'll see, we'll talk a little bit more about ghost mode, but that's how Snapchat indicates location. Okay. Or location settings, GPS settings. Okay. Uh, Kevin is helping me make sure I, oh, here's another question. What is your opinion about TikTok applications? Um, I will say TikTok does a lot better job monitoring um, uh, their posts. So if it's inappropriate content, they filter the people that can see the content. They don't send as many views or viewers to that content. Um, and, and if it's really bad, they take it down. Um, Snapchat doesn't do that. They rely on people to report. Mm -hmm. Schools seem to be encouraging social media, including Snap, for students to communicate and stay engaged in school. Why? So again, it, it is a good platform. It's just it, because of its uniqueness, it has that dangerous capability. Um, social media can be a good thing and it can promote good things and it can help to see good things going on in the community. Um, a lot of what this needs to happen Number one is the accountability piece of the application itself, but also at having the same amount of adults on the application as we have our kids on the applications, because then we can see what they see and we can report what maybe they're not reporting. And maybe, and you guys will learn further on about teaching them some of those tools. And then we had, uh, I believe this is our last question right now is how do we reach you to come to our school? You will see that at the end, there will be a, some information for that. Okay, thank you. I, I think that's all we have for now. I'll keep track of the questions and uh, get to those after uh, Sergeant Popsy presents. Awesome. Thank you. So again, guys, you're gonna hear from Sergeant Popsy. She's gonna go into what we can do as adults, parents and caregivers to protect our kids. You're gonna see some interesting pieces about lingo. Um, another piece, you're gonna wanna take a picture of the slide. So. I'll turn it over to you, Amanda. All right, perfect. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so we're at what can you do, right? We've talked about a whole bunch of interesting things that Snapchat has to offer, but we're gonna uh, go more into details, you know, as a parent, caregiver, uh, someone who works with the youth, what is it that you can do now? Uh, first and foremost, be easy on yourself, but remain honest as well. Many caregivers don't know to what extent social media um, they have on their youth lives. Uh, keeping up with social media trends, uh, you can do this by maybe talking to the youth in your life, or maybe it's creating your own Snapchat account uh, so you can follow groups, uh, uh, follow your who, who your youth follow, um, but be honest with them about what you're doing. This will help them to trust you and not feel as though they're you know, being spied on. And as I mentioned before, you know, talking to your youth, having an open and honest conversation with your youth and making sure that you're having them often. This will be your most powerful tool, right? Um, before approaching your youth, ask yourself, is my child at risk for using drugs, alcohol, or tobacco products? Do their peers use? Uh, do they understand the risk of uh, drug and alcohol use? And what would make them want to use or turn to these uh, drugs, alcohol, or tobacco products? Uh, knowing their, uh, by talking with them, you know, this can be a great time to also get to know more about their stressors. Is it uh, something going on at school? Is it uh, busy schedules, drama, um, chores at home, you know, things at home? Uh, this is just more, again, you know, using this, um, 
as a moment for you to get to, uh, at the same level as your, your youth, you know, uh, tell me about the pep rally yesterday. Um, you know, if you're following them on social media, use that as a segue to start talking, having this conversation. Um, simple, non-threatening questions are an easy way to import, uh, to promote those important conversations. Um, if the stressors are identified, talk through them with your team. Uh, this isn't, you know, you don't have to try to solve their problems unless you, you know, they ask you to, but rather express that you are there for them, even just to listen, no matter the circumstances that they are facing. And Amanda, can I add real quick to on those stressors? One mm -hmm. of the things that is important for your kids to understand is that if they have stressors that maybe you stress about, right? So maybe you're stressed about financials. Maybe you're stressed about an impending divorce. Maybe you're stressed about, am I going to have enough money for groceries to feed everybody or to keep the lights on in the house? We have to understand that our kids feel that same stress, but the difference for them is that they have zero control. So it's important not to discredit their feelings towards that stress. Perfect. Thank you for adding that. So on the monitoring, right, monitor your child's social media activity. We mentioned before, maybe that means you uh, having an account yourself. Uh, know who they are talking to are online and ask, are these people that you know in person or are they just virtual friends? Um, ask uh, if you see something and you don't know what it means, you know, ask them. Um, and we'll also go over some lingo here in the next slide so you can get a better under understanding of what you might see. So here we have know the lingo. On the left-hand side, I'm sure a lot of you have seen these hashtags. There's, you know, hashtag weed for sale, M30, 420. Uh, but real quick, I'll pick a couple and I'd like to see if anyone can tell me what they think DOC means. So the acronyms that are in the in the middle, uh, what do you think DOC means? I think we're stumped. I don't Deep. see. No clue. Drug of choice. Oh yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. Thank so, you. Some, you're right, yeah, drug of choice. Uh, how about uh, PAL? That one might be a little more common, but it's it has stumped a few people before. P-A-L. I know this one. Parents are listening. Yes. Yep. That's right. Um, okay. So we'll go over to, let's go over to the emojis. So we'll start with the very top because it's kind of hard to, um, I know there's quite a few on there. Can anyone tell me what they feel that the um, top one that you see the snowflake, the snowman, um, what they think that, okay, yeah, Coke, Molly, Coke. you're right. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, you see the trees and the, the, the cloud that's um, marijuana, a coating syrup is the third one, MDMA pills is the fourth, methamphetamine, heroin is the second to the last, and of course, um, mushrooms at the bottom. How about the all the way to the right? There's a fuel pump up there. Can anyone tell me what they think that might mean or indicate? Just a little fuel pump at the very top, all the way to the right. Speed. Speed. Okay. So that one is being gassed. So maybe um, they're drunk or intoxicated. Um, how about the very last one? There's, there's a pie. Does anyone have an idea of what the pie means? And then we'll move on. Munchies, Munchies. edible. <laughs> so that, uh, depending on who's using it on here, but where, for what the drug dealers, if they're putting a pie out there, it can mean making large amounts of drugs. So there's like a new batch coming out, right? So these are just some of the things that might come up, right? So I did want to emphasize just real quick, because I had some parents ask um, in previous presentations. Number one, on the line where you see the marijuana emojis, the shopping cart, that is related to carts, which are vape things that they can put into the vapes. 
Mm-hmm. And they typically, those are now um, widely popular to have THC. Um, the other one that I want to mention, the other thing I want to mention is the hashtags. And I see the, the ask in here to go through these. Um, I can go through them really quick, Amanda, if you don't mind. Yeah, we can either do that now or do it at the end, whichever. Okay, yeah, let's do it at the end. And then um, the acronyms at the end, I'll give you guys. Yeah, because we didn't go through all of the acronyms either. Yeah, all of the acronyms. Okay, Lexi, got it. Just a piece on the hashtags. Any social media platform that you go on to, when you open up the search bar, if you search hashtag and whatever, whatever term, if that term was put into the description of the content, you will see every post made. You can do this on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all of them. Um, All Mm -hmm. you have to do is search that hashtag. So again, another way that these kids are finding people that are posting things with the hashtags. Right. Okay, perfect. So at the end, we'll go through uh, all of those acronyms. Okay, so here's uh, some more uh, pictures of some SNAP menus. Uh, Know what the SNAP drug dealers are using to promote their sales, right? Get to know what they look like. Uh, You as a parent can also report these anonymously if you come across them, and we'll go over where you can find that in a later slide. And Thompson, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but these came from a local law enforcement agency, correct? Yes, all the photos you see on these three slides were all provided from actual cases here in Arizona. Great. So dealers will post photos of the drugs that they're selling. Notice these emojis and we talked about, that we talked about are on many of these uh, pictures. So now we're into talking about internet safety. Uh, You can turn off GPS capabilities. Sergeant Thompson had mentioned that before. Um, Adjust privacy and location settings and all social media applications to off. Uh, Make sure you talk uh, with your youth about not adding people or contacting people that they don't know. Uh, Also emphasize not to give out personal information such as last names, family members, school information, uh, address, anything that can um, lead back to them or identify who they are. Be aware of your surroundings when taking pictures or making videos. Avoid uh, personally identifiable items. Um, Again, don't agree to link up with strangers you meet online. But also use this as a moment to empower your youth. Explain that they should notify someone they trust if they feel threatened or unsafe. This does not have to be uh, a parent. It can be a close family member, friend, teacher, school resource officer, counselor, et cetera. And again, show them that they have the ability to anonymously report to any application or site anything they may see that is illegal, inappropriate, or unsafe. And Sergeant Thompson, did you want to point out that um, on yeah. Snapchat that there is one specifically for uh, drug yeah. or weapons, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So what I like to point out with Snapchat specifically is when you go in to report content, number one, we address that this can be done anonymously. So parents can do it, kids can do it, empower them because they know what's right and wrong. But when you go in to report, there is a specific topic to report the attempt to buy or sell drugs or weapons. So again, Snapchat knows this is happening on their platform, but they are not actively stopping it themselves like some of the other platforms do. Right. Perfect. And then someone had mentioned previously about ghost mode. Um, and in the prison or in the slide, you can see on the left hand side, there it is. And it says ghost mode. When enabled, your friends can't see your location. So just click on that button. So despite all your efforts, your youth may find themselves in sticky situations. And this is where we like to uh, emphasize making a game plan, you know, work together to develop uh, something that your youth can follow. Emphasize that simply saying no is okay. And majority of kids their age do say no when it comes to, um, you know, misusing drugs alcohol or tobacco. So allow your team to use, uh, making a game plan is allowing your team to use you as the excuse to get out of a potentially bad situation. 
Uh, for, so for example, if your teen finds themselves being offered a pill from a friend, you know, maybe you have a word that they like to use, um, you know, a butterfly, and that's your code for, hey, they need you and you need to come and get them. Or maybe it's a phone call. Um, one of the individuals that we work with, they like to use the um, uh, feed the dog example. So it's, you know, a, a son calls, uh, um, texts the dad saying, hey, I forgot, you know, to feed the dog. Uh, this is, I, you know, I'm so sorry. And that, and that's dad's cue of, okay, you know, I need to come and help my son. Uh, something's going on. And he just, goes with the conversation and eventually ends it with, okay, I need to come and get you, um, you're coming home. And teen is able to re remove himself from that situation. So if your teen does plan to leave the house, get the location of where they are going, uh, name, number of at least one friend that they will be with. For extra precaution, get that friend's parental contact information as well. Uh, let your teen know that no matter the time of day, you are available to them. Um, be and stay proactive. So constantly reminding your youth that they have a strong support system at home. Actively listen to their thoughts, comments, and concerns. Again, we mentioned it before, you know, getting to understand, um, you know, some of those stressors that they might be going to, uh, going through or having. And then understand the resources available to you and your youth. So uh, here we have the Governor's Office of Youth, Faith, and Family, the HIDA, a DAA parent talk kits. And then also, you know, you have SYCC. Uh, they are so great about getting you into contact if you're needing help. Rachel um, and Christine, they're, they're amazing people to turn to. And so now we go into know how and where to look, right? Use your nose, watch their behavior, look them in the eye, search their spaces. Um, you know, by using your using your nose, having a real face-to-face -face conversation when your child comes home after hanging out with friends, um, if there has been drinking or smoking, the smell is going to be there, right? Um, and on their clothing or on their hair, maybe in their hair. Look them in the eyes. Uh, pay, pay attention to their eyes, which will be red and heavy uh, lidded uh, with constricted pupils. If they've been using marijuana, um, pupils will be dilated and they may have difficulty focusing if they've been drinking. Uh, so those are just some of the signs that, um, you know, if your youth might be using. Uh, watch their behavior. So how do they act after a night out with friends? Are they particularly loud and obnoxious or laughing hysterically? Maybe they're unusually clumsy. Um, sullen, withdraw, withdrawn, um, these might just be uh, some other indicators. And then search their spaces. So the limits you set with your child don't stop at the front door or their bedroom door. If you have cause for concern, it's important to find out what's going on. So be prepared you know, to explain your reasons for um, going through your youth stuff, depending, depending on their age, you know, they might not. Um, Again, like Thompson had mentioned, you know, before, you know, this is my, her son's phone, but she's, it's, it's hers, though, ultimately, she's just letting her son violate. So um, know that you can let them know that it's out of concern for their, their health and safety. Um, common places to conceal vapes, uh, alcohol, drugs, or paraphernalia include inside drawers, beneath or between other items in small boxes or cases, thinking like jewelry or makeup or um, cases, um, under your bed, pieces of, fur uh, under pieces of furniture, um, those are some other areas. And again, don't forget to check the cell phones. Look for frequently called numbers that they may not, that may not be saved or that don't look familiar to you. And remember those hashtags, emojis, and acronyms that we had um, shown you earlier. Amanda, can I just add real quick on that? The biggest piece sure. of takeaway, you guys, is to be awake when they get home. Um, <clears throat> you will see and catch things when you meet them at the door. So giving them a curfew and trusting them to come home because maybe you checked the camera and they got home on time is great. But if you don't meet them at the door, then you can't see these signs. Perfect. Thank you for adding that. 
So these are just some of the signs um, uh, of substance use or misuse. So uh, figuring out if your child is using substances can be really challenging. Uh, many of the signs and symptoms are typical teen or use adult behavior, but many are also symptoms, uh, can be symptoms of mental health issues. Um, however, it's important that you educate yourself on, um, you know, maybe these behavioral, behavioral changes and uh, we'll come up, cover some more. Uh, signs and symptoms but, uh, of a person who is currently under the influence and or going through a withdrawal, keeping in mind that substance uh, signs of substance use will vary depending on the substance that is being misused. Um, so we have like physical health, shifts in mood and personality, and hygiene and appearance. And I won't go through all of these, but um, prolonged use can also lead to these physical changes, you know, such as extreme weight loss or, or gain, sores on the face, sweating, uh, poor hygiene. Um, an individual under the influence will have a change in mood or personality as well. They can exhibit extreme energy or be less motivated. Uh, they can be silent or hostile. Recognizing the change will allow you to determine the potential substance that they are using. Uh, so, um, you know, do some research, get to know what the signs and symptoms of um, uh, opioid misuse could be. Um, the signs of substance use, again, will vary depending on the drug that is being misused. Uh, opioids are a class of drugs found in the opium part that cause a variety of effects in the brain. Uh, they block or reduce the number of pain signals sent to the brain, making them effective pain killers. So examples of that could be uh, in, uh, fentanyl, heroin, uh, morphine, oxycodone, Percocet. Um, so these are just some more examples. Here we have stimulants. So stimulants are a type of drug that stimulate or increase the activity of the central nervous system. They produce feelings of euphoria and well-being and can increase alertness, focus, and energy. Examples are methamphetamine, cocaine, ecstasy, Adderall, and Ritalin. And again, we just have a list of uh, some of those symptoms that they might be experiencing. Here we have depressant misuse. Um, depressants, sometimes called downers, are substances that reduce brain stimulation or otherwise depress nervous system activity. Some examples include, can be alcohol, Xanax, Valium, and um, many more, Ambien, Lunesta. Some signs that an individual is using depressants include slow brain function, dilated pupils, inability to urinate or disorientation, some behavioral signs to know include reduced inhibitions, reduced anxiety, slow reaction time, and enhanced moods. So again, just kind of doing the research, getting to know what these uh, signs and symptoms might be of substance use. And one of the things that we definitely like to point out is to have a safeguard. So this is Narcan. Um, I like to tell people, you know, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, naloxone or Narcan, also known as Narcan, is an FDA approved life-saving medical um, essential available at low to no cost. Naloxone medication reverses the effects of opioid overdose. Some of the most serious symptoms of an opioid overdose is respiratory arrest and respiratory failure. So naloxone has the ability to temporarily reverse opioid overdose symptoms by binding to the opioid receptors to reverse and block the effects of other opioids until medical help arrives. Um, Although Narcan um, is a prescription medication, all states have passed laws to increase access to naloxone in the community and in homes where opioids are present. So in every state, residents can request to purchase Narcan um, directly from a pharmacist under a statewide naloxone standing order or collaborative, collaborative practice agreement. 
Um, so residents you can, uh, can also get with their local community-based organization or drug prevention coalition as they have the ability to um, order uh, Narcan. Uh, let's see, so I'll go, because I know there's a lot of information on this one. So real quick, if you do get naloxone, uh, the nasal spray is simple to use and there is no harm in administering this medication to someone who you suspect is experiencing an overdose but are unsure. There's some three simple steps and it, if you do get this box, it even has it on the inside of the, um, there's like a little cover that you can open and it'll be on there, peel, press, place, um, peel, place, press, sorry. Um, the nasal uh, into the nose and press, uh, and it has all the steps in there and even some of the signs and symptoms of what an overdose might be looking like. So um, educate your youth about the Good Samaritan law if it applies in your state. So this law was passed in Arizona in 2018. It protects a person in the event they need to receive aid or render aid as a result of a drug-related overdose. So in Arizona, we have had youth overdose and pass away while being with friends because the friends were afraid to call for help, thinking that they would get in trouble. So this law also protect, protects those who administer naloxone in good faith believing someone is suffering from an overdose um, from legal action. Realizing that your teen or young adult child needs help for substance use can be frightening and overwhelming. So if it's important to take any substance use seriously, but before acting on impulse, take a breath and review strategies for communicating effectively and encouraging positive behavior change. Um, these are just some of those steps that we like to put out there, right? Take a breath, get on the same page with anyone sharing uh, the parent the um, you know, parenting responsibilities. Uh, prepare to be called a hypocrite. Your child may ask, have you ever tried drugs? Um, there are ways to answer honestly that keep the emphasis less on you and more on what you want for your child. Don't let your response become a justification for substance um, use. Focus on the issue at hand. Uh, gather any evidence, uh, expect anger from them, uh, plan to remain calm. So we saw in that video um, from Alex family, the mom, she mentioned that she wanted to talk to him about it, but he kind of withdrew. Um, so keep reminding yourself to speak and, and listen from a place of love, support, and concern. Uh, try to stay as calm and relaxed as possible throughout the conversation. Start talking um, be clear in communication, express how much you care, explain that the reason you're talking and asking questions is because you want them to be healthy, safe, and happy. Um, work through those barriers. It can be difficult to get past um, a flat out denial of substance use. Some kids can't bear to take responsibility for their behavior and wanna look good at all costs, but focusing on their behavior and why it worries you. Um, don't make it sound like you think your child is a bad person because they tried substances. Um, establish rules and consequences. Again, um, a step nine, monitor. Uh, monitor what, what's going on, um, you know, any behaviors, uh, keep a close eye on them. Take notes, keep notes. Um, this can be extremely useful to keep records of everything that concerns you over time. Um, make sure you have dates, um, what happened, where it occurred, what was found, and your child may try to convince you the things that things didn't happen the way you remember, or that the things you found are not what you think they are. In the event it becomes necessary to seek outside help, your notes will provide valuable information. And I, the, lastly, 11, positive reinforcement. Recognize any small step your child takes toward um, the healthier behavior you want to encourage. If your child hasn't done any homework for weeks but completes one assignment, reinforce it with a tangible reward or a kind comment. Avoid the uh, it's about uh, time comments or it is much, you know, it is much more 
reinforcing when youth are recognized for their efforts rather than having um, everyone just assume that they should be doing it without a word or an action of recognition. So these are some more resources that we have. Um, this comes from uh, the Partnership to End Addiction for Drug-Free drug -free Kids. Um, but again, I like to point out that, you know, you have SYCC here. So again, you know, reach out to Rachel, reach out to Christine, um, go on their website. They have a wonderful list of resources that you can, uh, local here, Arizona resources that you can um, utilize. And then if you have your cell phone, please go ahead, take it, um, take it out, or you're on your laptop, screenshot this. Uh, these are, again, some more um, Arizona-based resources that anyone can use. I'll give it one second, and I'll go to the next slide. And again, take a picture of this as well. These are resources that your youth can use. We have Suicide Prevention Line, Teen Lifeline. Uh, again, really great resources that you can use, that your youth can use. What I will say with this resources for youth, ask your kids if they've seen these. Um, a lot of schools here in Arizona have implemented this on the back of the student ID cards. Um, so these kids are well aware of these resources in some of the communities that we visit. Um, if they don't, if their school hasn't provided it, give it to them. Um, because some of these have teenagers that are on volunteer time um, there to talk to these kids and maybe they'll relate better than mom or dad will. Right. Yep. Teen Lifeline is a pretty popular one that we've seen for the schools that we work at. All right. So we'll, we will take questions, but I believe Sergeant Thompson, this is, there's a post survey. Yes. So the survey, if you guys remember, we took in the beginning. Um, if you can, please take this survey for the conclusion of the presentation and pretty similar questions. Um, but again, we are doing this for evaluation purposes. Um, and we'll leave it up for a minute. The next slide does have contact information if you want to reach out or have further questions um, or just anything you want to share. But yeah, if we have any other questions, Rachel, um, the, the link for the survey is in the chat if anybody missed it on the slide. Thank you so much. Such it, Interesting and scary information. It's so good to have it. Um, uh, okay, a first question is what is rocket? So the rocket can indicate potency. So that's a high potency substance or that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. And then did you want to go over the acronyms? I know there's been a lot of interest in what yeah. all the acronyms are. Yeah, I'll go back to that slide, but let me just. Okay, as you're going back to it, I'll ask another question. Uh, what can you do if your teen thinks vaping and drinking is quote unquote normal teen behavior? So, and oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that Aurora and the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition is uh, having a lunch and learn for professionals and parents and adults on November 5th on that very subject from um, one of our board members, ASAP, uh, Adolescent Substance Abuse Program. So you can send an email, um, put your email in the chat, make sure you're on our mailing list, on Aurora's mailing list and uh, join us. It'll be so interesting. We'll and sure go ahead. Send, we'll be sure to send that link out when we send uh, a recording of the presentation as well. So you guys can Beautiful. sign up directly right from there. Thank awesome. You. So just to answer your question, um, the coalitions and multiple other entities, and honestly for public record, um, if you're doing research and you wanna know the perspective of our kids, they have something in Arizona called the Arizona Youth Survey. It is a survey done every other year for kids starting in their fresh, or I believe it's their freshman year. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's seventh grade. And so seventh grade, ninth grade, and 11th grade, they do a survey with them to talk about these substances and about different topics to include gang activity, to include um, just a myriad of things. And you can get that information. Uh, Katie put it in there from the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission Youth Survey um, is another one. But you can look at this data. And if you want to show your kids 
the perception, you can show them that people their age taking the survey indicate that they say no more times than they say yes. So saying no is normal. Um, our kids kind of get stuck in their head and wanting to be friends, um, wanting to fit in with their friends. So maybe they think that, you know, my friends are doing it. I would look weird if I don't do it. Um, helping them to understand that more of your friends are saying no than are saying yes, but then also giving them that tool to um, use you as the escape. So maybe they don't want to, they're not comfortable saying no, you can still say, Hey, you know, what's wrong. Call me, let the, again, let them make you the, the reason why they have to leave. May, let them make you the bad guy. So um, we have the, the infamous slide up here. <laughs> I know I talked about hashtags um, with the hashtags. You guys, if you hear your kids say something, uh, maybe they say something all the time. My newest one with my son is sheesh right? S-H-E-E-E-S-H. -E 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 -S -H. And I'm drives me nuts. And I'm like, dude, what are you, why are you saying this? And it's a TikTok meme. Um, but you can hashtag search that in any platform. For the acronyms, um, the first one we, we did decide or we did explain it's drug of choice. P-I is parent investigating. So my parents investigating. Um, POS, I'm sure we can all as adults think about what that means, but for our kids, that can be parent over shoulder and that's simultaneous with mom over shoulder or dad over shoulder um, with MOS or DOS. KD9, or it can come over as the word code and the number nine is parents are around. So my parents are in the area. KPC is keeping parents clueless. PAL, parents are listening. S, the number two, and R is send to receive. So you would see this if, for instance, let's talk about pictures, right? Uh, a kid wants a picture of another kid. Well, I'll send you a picture if you send me a picture. Um, I'll bring you drugs if you send me money. Um, I'll get you alcohol if you send me money. So send to receive. Send me this to receive that. Um, and then KYS, I include this. It's not drug related, but I include it because it is a huge problem within our schools and with our youth, but it is kill yourself. So if you see that come across as a text message from somebody to your kids, or if you see your kids send this text message to somebody, ask the questions. And, and honestly, that's what this comes down to is ask the questions of what these things mean. Your kids might not tell you the truth, but if you've done the research and you've looked up what things could mean, then you're already a step ahead of them. And you can say, well, I've heard it meant this. Have you ever heard that before? Um, and then another one I know that we didn't address was the outlet plug. So that can be a connection. So I have a connection with a drug dealer. I have a, I have a plug for that substance. Um, hashtag M30, I see it in the comments. That is those little blue pills that are typically laced with fentanyl or that are laced with fentanyl. I don't want to say typically because more times than not in almost every case and all of our law enforcement are treating it as they are laced, they have fentanyl in them. Um, something if you, when you listened to Ale, um, Amy Neville's story, she said that they are not laced that they are fentanyl. What she is saying is that this, these pills, because they're pressed in this on the streets, they are made by drug dealers. There is no regulatory factor. So we're not talking about crushed up pills with a little bit of fentanyl sprinkled in them. We're talking about, I have fentanyl, a case of fentanyl on the table, and I have some random pills on a table. I crush all of them up and I mix them together and then I press them into whatever form. Most basic way I can explain it. There is no regulation on it. There is no way to track how much of what is in there. So that's why she said her son had Pat had overdosed on enough fentanyl to kill three people. While the pill he might've taken the day before from the same exact dealer didn't have any fentanyl in it. So the, it's mixed effects. Um, they might be Oxycontins that are crushed up, but then they're mixed with other things and they're pressed. asking if there if you have a document that has the emojis and the abbreviations listed just in case we forget i we can definitely provide one um, for this specific slide what i will say is there is thousands <laughs> if you guys think about it we use lol as adults we use brb for be right back so they, these aren't new concepts, but we just have to look up what they mean. But yes, we can provide one for this slide specifically. Um, I see the question in there for what is hashtag Tina. Tina is a term used for methamphetamine. Uh, we had a comment uh, that was pretty interesting about how kids can save uh, 
people's contact numbers under um, aliases. So it doesn't have to necessarily be drug dealer. It could be Jenny or whatever the name might be. I thought that was interesting. You might see somebody in their phone named Tina. Well, do they know a Tina? Yeah. And after- uh, I had a question about if you use the Narcan nasal spray and they are not overdosing, what are the side effects? It is painful. So a lot of the stigma reduction that we do with this is helping people to understand that this isn't a speedball that we're promoting to be given, um, that we're promoting to be in people's first aid kits. It is extremely painful, which if you were to look at different videos of people who have had Narcan administered to them, they usually wake up in a fit and they are angry. It's because it doesn't feel good. So again, to answer your question, if somebody who's not overdosing gets that into their system, I like to relate it back to kids, right? If my child gets into the Narcan, I have in our medicine cabinet, it's not going to feel good, but it's not going to have an effect. It's not going to give her a race of energy. It's not, uh, you know, a stimulant. It's, I'm still going to call poison control and I'm still going to call her pediatrician, but it's not going to have an effect because she wouldn't have had an opioid in her system. So we, we have just a minute or two left. If there's any last question that someone wants to put in the chat. I did, I did see a question. If you guys, I mean, if you can stop the screen share, I want to show real quick. Somebody had mentioned about how to get to the ghost mode. <clears throat> so can you guys see my screen? So this is my Snapchat that's open. If I click on, I got to like, do this. If I click on my little face, right? My little emoji, <clears throat> it comes up like this. So I know somebody had asked about the, the score. If this little symbol, that ghost looking symbol shows up next to the snap score, their settings are off. So people cannot see, they can't see this function because my settings are off, right? My location settings. Now, if you're looking for the ghost mode settings, you would click on. So once you have your profile open, you click on the little gear symbol. Just wanting, see, I'm trying to do this without (laughs) the little gear symbol and it opens up into a list of different functions that I can change. What I am looking more into currently, um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but you can actually add your mobile phone number so your kids can add their phone numbers to this application. Now this was not on there, this is new. Um, And I'm still looking into that function, which is why you can't really see much about it or I haven't updated it. Um, But if you scroll down right here, it says, who can see, who can, and it says, contact me, view my stories, see my location, see me in, see me in quick ad. So you would click on see my location. And when you click on see my location, again, there's the ghost mode. So my ghost mode is on. I can select who I want to see me in ghost mode. So do I want my friends to be able to see me still? Do I want my friends accept certain people to see me? Do I only want certain people on my friends list to see me? So they they can choose. Um, I obviously just keep mine off. Um, you can, they can turn on a setting that allows people to request where they're located. So these are all the location settings, which again, they make it hard to find (laughs) and they call it a name that is not GPS location. So it's not promoted, which makes it even more dangerous. Uh, Sergeant Thompson, there's a question. If you're on ghost mode, can you still see other people's location on snap on the snap map? Yes. So. I am currently on ghost mode and this is what my snap map currently looks like. So I can see all the people on my friends list that have their location settings on. And can, and parents, I can oh, go ahead. I was going to say, there's a question. Can parents still see their kids location if it's turned off? Only if they have that as only can see me. Otherwise, no, you cannot see them. Um, and only because I have the permission to do so, I wanted to show you guys <clears throat> what it looks like when you scroll in with a bit emoji over the top. So this is a family friend of mine. Again, she's aware, <laughs> but it doesn't show her 
you know, in the front of her house. It doesn't show her in the back of the house. It shows where her phone is currently located in her house. And if she were to move, that bit emoji would move. And it was funny, Amanda and I went to Flagstaff to present this and we watched ourselves drive out of the police department. This has been so informative and so interesting. And um, as a parent of a, a middle schooler and a late uh, elementary school age person I, and a therapist, it's pretty scary and wonderful to have this information. So thank you, Sergeant Thompson and Sergeant Popsy on behalf of the Scottsdale Youth and Community Coalition. Thank you, Aurora Behavioral Health System for always supporting such great information. And we wish you all a wonderful night. Jordan, do you have any final words? Yeah, thank you just everyone for taking time out of your busy lives and schedules to join us here tonight. And we hope that you took something from it. Um, we hope that you can continue to share that with those in your life as well, uh, for those that weren't able to make it to this tonight. So um, I just saw another question again, just final reminder, folks, um, we will be putting the recording live. It'll be on our um, Aurora, Arizona YouTube page, as well as our website. Uh, and we will go ahead and send out an email to everyone registered uh, with that page where it's going to be once it's uploaded and it's on the site. Uh, lastly, if you do require a certificate of attendance or anything like that, like, for example, if you, you know, went to this through work and want to get some credit there, um, again, just send an email to myself, Jordan Peterson. I'm the one that's been harassing you via email. Uh, feel free to send an email to that and we'll make sure that you get one. And lastly, uh, they shared some fantastic resources and we're so grateful for that. Uh, but I'd, I'd be remiss to say if we also, our hospitals do inpatient and outpatient services for youth ages 13 years and older. And so for if you are looking for an immediate assessment and you have someone that's in crisis, um, also don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. We're happy to do that assessment 24-7 uh, hours or 24-7 rather. So um, anyway, I hope everyone has a wonderful day and uh, or rest of your evening. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you.